Just imagine that you're George Washington or Benjamin Franklin and you're going to start a nation. How do you start? Where do you begin? It must have been a real task. Well, my name's Caroline and, and I work doing? for Congressman Ralph Hall. Yeah. And tell us where we're at. We are in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. And tell us a little bit about it. All right, well, that painting at the top is called the Apotheosis of George Washington. It means the descent into heaven. It's painted by a man named Constantino Vermini. That painting is over 4,000 square feet. At the top of that dome, many people call the statue liberty or freedom or America. But at the top of the dome, one of the things that Washington and Jefferson and Franklin did is they tried to introduce deeply intellectual historical concepts into the design of Washington, D.C. And the lady on top of the dome, at the very center of the dome on top, is not liberty or freedom or an American native woman, although her crown does look like feathers. The lady at the top of the dome is the Roman goddess Minerva, the goddess of strength, wisdom, and protection. And atop of her head is not feathers, but an old Egyptian crown, because the Romans got Minerva from the Greek Shakespeare, because she was so frightening to people she caused their spears to shake. Athena, the Greeks, got her from the Zosterians, who got her from the god Isis. Isis from Egypt believed in enlightenment, seeking the light. That's what the uh, pyramids, that's what the obelisk was all about. Our founding fathers went to history and said, let's design a nation based on historical studies, the design, the philosophy, the streets, the buildings, the architecture, even the art was all based on historical consideration by our forefathers. Well, here we have it. Look at this facility. What do you think, Sonny? Oh, it's great. It's amazing, isn't it? One of the great buildings in Washington is built by the Masons, by the, the Scottish Rite. This is the House of the Temple. It is a remarkable structure and it was once named one of the most extraordinary buildings in the world. The building has attracted enormous interest. It is a beauty. Building superintendent under building and grounds. What are you seeing in terms of growth for the uh, order? Uh, well, we're seeing uh, massive expansion in a lot of our local lodges here in D.C. Are they old or young? Uh, the, the craft is, is being barraged with young men coming to our doors. You know, we're hearing this all over the nation. Would you say it's true? Absolutely. From what I hear, it will be a plus for the future of our craft. Thank you. Matt Samosky, Director of Development for the Supreme Council. Really? Sure. The, the House of the Temple was designed by John Russell Pope. He is the same architect that designed Jefferson Memorial and the National Archives and about 12 state capitals. He also did a lot of private residences. This was his first private building that he did, non-government building. And uh, when it was finished, Architectural Digest ranked it one of the most important buildings in the country. And let me tell you about a few of the features on the front. Now, You'll notice what year was that? 1915 is when it was completed. 1915. They laid the cornerstone wow. in 1911, and four years later they had completed the building. That was kind of the heyday, too. Everything was just rolling. Then, it right? was. That was kind of the golden age of Masonic architecture. A lot of the really yeah. magnificent buildings were made during that time. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't be able to construct this now when they built it. They actually laid a railroad track down 16th Street to get the materials here because of the weight of the stone and, and everything that was used in its construction. And uh, I don't think today you could do it. Yeah. It would be a, a little, little difficult. Yeah. You might have a stone face and it would probably be a steel structure with just a little veneer over it would look nice. The two sphinxes were actually carved here on site. They were kind of roughly carved out in the shape of the sphinx. One has, the one on your right here has the eyes that are really supposed to be like half closed. And that one represents wisdom. The one on the other side, the eyes are fully open and that represents strength. And then, of course, the steps coming up here for Masons are very important because there's three, five, and seven as we come up. I was counting the right. steps as I came up, yeah. The address is kind of unique, too. They actually got an act of Congress to change the address. Now, we're at 16th Street, and uh, we really were supposed to be at the I don't know, 1750, but they got changed to 1733, 33, the important number for Scottish right? But then to take the 17 and add to 16th Street, you get 33 also. So kind of an evil. That is great. Uh, the two doors, the entrance doors, are solid bronze. Uh, they weigh about two and a half tons each. 
And then if you'll notice at the top, if you look up, you'll see some scaffolding where we're doing some work on the building now. But there are 33 columns around the building, obviously again representing the 33rd degree of the Scottish Light. Beautiful. The uh, behind there, you'll notice that little motif that's in the front there. That is, uh, of course, the double head eagle of the Scottish Light. And that is supposed to be the rays of the sun coming out behind it. And around on the bottom, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see when we go inside the building. That is a design of the House of Temples Library is the oldest public library in Washington, D.C. Originally, it was located in Judiciary Square, which our old building was there. Uh, it opened in the 1800s, and it preceded all of the city's public libraries and other nonprofits that have ones. It is uh, anybody in the public can come here to use the library. It is open to everyone. It smells of old books, too. It, it, it does, yeah. <laughs> and this is the room that people come to for doing Oh, look at the scale of this. Yes, yes. And we have, I'll show you downstairs. Now, they're right now going through every book in the library, and something we have to do eventually, we never did, was we never had an ascension and descension policy. So if, if you loved reading, you might have called us up. And we wouldn't take, uh, you know, readers that just going to books, but we did take a lot that we probably shouldn't have done. So they're going through it now because the focus of our library is masonry, history, religion, and philosophy. Oh, so yeah. those are our core areas that we want to grow in. Some of these are so old. Oh, yes. yes. But you the library was absolutely fascinating. The books were so ancient. Sonny and actually, I sat here for hours reading and studying, and it was terrific, and the curator most helpful. In this library, I learned that every August the 10th, as the setting sun, sets directly over Pennsylvania Avenue, three stars become visible. A straight line from the Capitol to the White House to the sky. Regulus, Arcturus, and Spicer, the stars form a right angle triangle framing the constellation Virgo. Virgo was also known to the Romans as Minerva. You say he was a poet? Yes. But I mean, were they sentimental or? Uh... You know, they're a real cross section. I've only seen a few of them, but he did publish several books of poetry. Uh, the ones I saw were signed, but there were a couple that were about, uh, uh, like, you know, a, a youth sitting in a field and describing everything he's seen. So there was a variety of poems. There's like, a... it was published. It was not, not just within the sign frame, but outside as well. Little Shakespeare. But he's kind of forgotten about it, too, as far as the poetry aspect. We're at the rear of the building, that rounded part, yeah. and the library wraps all around there. And there are a few real interesting things over here on my right, is the first Masonic book that was printed in uh, North America by Benjamin Franklin. He printed it? And, yes, there's about 40 copies of that in the world today that are still in existence. Wow. And how, how much does it differ from uh, what we would not see much, today? Not much, not much. If your Grand Lodge has a monitor, yeah. I would say probably 85-90% uh, of the wording in there you would recognize without a problem. No kidding. This is the Bible that was used at George Washington's funeral. That's on loan to the library now from Federal Lodge. And then along with the books, there are displays uh, in this room, mostly Masonic regalia, uh, rings, jewels. A uh, couple of interesting things, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dudley Watch Company. They were, in America, probably the, one of the premier watch companies in the early, uh, late 1800s or 1900s. And they made a lot of Masonic watches. What was really unique about them was that all the workings on the inside, the springs and all the different things made the watch work, were made to look like Masonic emblems. No. And we have their, you can see it here, here's the original one. If you look on the inside of the workings, you can see they're all little Masonic emblems. Unbelievable. I can't focus that close, but wow. They're really beautiful watches. No, you know, nobody's better at this is than the Masonic people. Huh? It's beautiful. Look at these rings. If you look at the detail work too, it's a shame nowadays it's almost impossible to find the, the quality of the detail that they used to do in a lot of the old jewels and rings. Yeah. We have two librarians, one full-time, one uh, part-time that assist all the visitors and researchers that come here. Interestingly, more than half of the folks that come to the library are not Masons. There are people that we have a rare book they want to research or something, so we get quite a few. Wow. This was a, a quite a donation for us a while ago too. If you're familiar with the Knights Templars mm -hmm. who fought during the Crusades, sure. um, of course they eventually got persecuted by the Catholic Church and they were uh, mm -hmm. seized, arrested, and Jacques de Molay, their last leader. On the 13th? But, yep, the Vatican about 10 years ago agreed to let some researchers come in for the first time ever and go through all of the records from the trials of the Templars. And when they did that, 
uh, they were allowed to, uh, they translated it into Italian and English. And in the book on the right, the white one, if you look at it on the left side, it's the Italian, the right's the English. And this leather bound on, on the left here is the original Latin. Long story short, it's all the records from the trial, so it really gives you a lot of insight in what was said and what charges were made. And uh, one of our members donated that. They only printed 500 editions, and they were about uh, 14,000 apiece. And luckily, we had a donor who uh, uh, felt that it was worthwhile for us to have that in the library. And that's one of the nice things about the library here at the House of Temples. We try to keep it updated. Yeah. It's not just the past of Masonry, but we also try to keep the present and the future here as well. And that's, and, but it had the Salve Fratera on there. And, they, and Pope, this is the only building that, private building that Pope also designed. It has special significance to that table. That was a design of his. And, and so are the chairs. Salve Frater Latin for welcome brother. Welcome brother. Yeah. So it greets every Scottish Rite Mason when they come in. Now what is this room called? This is the uh, main atrium. And uh, this is where all the folks who visit the House of Temple are greeting from here. They can go to the library or the museums. Pope also designed the chairs that you see around here, which have the double head eagle on them. And these lamps again were also custom designed. That's supposed to be Neptune on there. And Neptune, one of uh, you know Greek mythology, and uh, one of his virtues was wisdom, also justice. And then if you look at the lamps, see the those are figures from Greek mythology. That's Medusa, the middle. Don't look down at you all, but you're stone. Medusa. Well, now, uh, Pike was some kind of uh, genius, wasn't he? he? He was. Yes, absolutely. You know, when I uh, when I was reading that book, I couldn't believe the breadth, the range of it, right? No, not all 32. They just put the, uh, for lack of a better word, they have one over here. It's actually a square and compass, but they put what I what they call the mandatory degrees, the ones that you have to receive. Oh, okay. Like a four, eight, 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 eight. all the key ones. Not to say the others aren't important, but the key ones. Now, have I seen the double-headed eagle in the Roman art? There is some. They usually use a single, but there are some double-head eagles. Yeah. yeah, and it was used in a lot of cultures in, in, around the world. Yeah. Uh, Russia used one. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, uh, so the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Quite a few uh, places use the double eagle. Usually in that. Well, I know the folks who speak, but you get to stand while you're right here. <laughs> and this is also the only room that has a bow finish. The walls in here are stone, but that finish on it is actually a painted finish. Almost looks French, doesn't it? It does, have it is. And of course, the members of Spring Council sit around the side chairs, and the officer is the great commander or our leader, with Scottish Rite sits up in the front there, which is called the East, and he sits right underneath the crown. And then there was two lieutenant grand commanders. They said over here in the west. There's a secretary who does the same job for most organizations. Uh, Pike is actually buried behind that. They reinterred him here. When they opened the building, he was buried in a cemetery here in D.C. And when they opened the House of the Temple, they moved his remains it's on the wall right behind that bust. And this is our pillars of charity over here. This is uh, where we honor those folks who have made a million dollar or more contribution to our foundations. They get honored with the pillar of their name and what the gift is made for. And you could use 90 of these right now, right? Absolutely. In fact, let me ask you. I really, need, so, really need 85 now. If, if, <laughs> if someone wanted to contribute to the rebuilding of this temple or the maintenance of it, where, where would they talk to? What numbers, and et cetera? Sure. If uh, they contact us at the development office, they can call me directly at 202-777-3143, or they can go to the Scottish Rite website. Uh, which is www.scotchright.org and on the website there's information about our foundation the campaign and you can give online if you'd like to and i've got your head right beside his head this is john coles he was the grand commander uh shortly after they moved in here okay uh, this will be the behind the scenes thing now this is years ago they would have now they still use this if a caterer comes in to serve with those dumb waiters on the end would have gone down in the basement wow. Look at that. They would prepare all the food, put the dishes on there, bring it up, and then up here, or the, or the raw food, and then up here they might set up a place, and you go through the line, and they would get your meal. Yeah, well, so many places have torn out the old. You know, this reminds me of uh, the Jefferson Estate. Have you seen his yes, kitchens oh, there? Yeah, Doesn't it remind you of that sort of? Yep, yep. It's just beautiful all the cabinetry. You know, yes. Yeah. Look at this. Wow. And this is one of the bronzes that's on that door. 
And there's the cornerstone or a replica of it. And this is George Washington laying that cornerstone of the United States Capitol. Pretty cool. You notice he's got on his Masonic apron. This. See, uh, Th that is correct. The Scottish Rite today, one of the ways that we promote ourselves among Masons, a reason to join, is we consider ourselves the University of Freemasonry. And the real emphasis in the Scottish Rite is on receiving more light, uh, learning more about the, the history of our world as well as the history of man, and really how to treat one another, how to act. And we do that through all of the degrees in the Scottish Rite where we use lessons from many religions, many cultures. And if you look at our organization today, uh, the number of books that we produce that are put in print, the quality of the magazines, it really is serving as an educational tool both for members in the Scottish Rite and other folks in the community as well. But because of the membership and the various degrees, they have to study architecture and philosophy and science and uh, uh, many endeavors that these people would never study unless they went to college. And it's almost like a college degree, isn't it? It is a college degree. Absolutely, and, you know, and one of the places we're really doing a successful job nowadays with that is our Scottish Rite Research Society. And uh, once a year they publish a book called Herodom. And if you were to look at that, the variety of articles, the scholarly work that's done, uh, will cover everything from uh, Pythagoras to uh, you know, some lost symbol and really give you an in-depth, it's almost like taking a semester course at a university in, in 30 pages. Yeah. You're getting that kind of information, that kind of content. One of the things that surprised me is at the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., they have a garden for people to come and grow things back to the essential elements. Wow. Now, I want you to call off the names and see if you can recognize these faces. founding fathers, 14 or 15 of our presidents, Freemasons. When you think about the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, there was this great interest in all aspects of education, science, and math, astronomy. Uh, Pike had a great interest in everything from poetry to world religions, uh, philosophy, uh, ancient history, and he really, his, uh, what he read and what he wrote about was a, a very large area of interest. Uh, not uh, what we see today where so many people tend to be focused. Yeah. Uh, they may have an interest in the history of Britain or the Roman Empire, where Pike looked at the whole world and how it affected mankind. Confederate general, but he was interred in uh, uh, the National Cemetery, is that correct? That is correct, and he's also the only Confederate general that has a monument in Washington, D.C., yeah. over Judiciary Square. Yeah. Didn't, now, he had a scholarship to Harvard that he gave back to them, isn't that, that right? That, that's, that is correct, and uh, <laughs> he did well. Now, here's something you don't see much anymore. That is his death mask. In the Victorian period, when he died, uh, it was very popular at that time to take a photo of a deceased member of family or do a death mask, so you'd have an image of them. Wow. When they died. That is his actual death mask. His lawyer, he actually argued in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, he worked with Indian Affairs. Uh, just a little bit. He was a businessman. Well, I did a little bit of everything. He was real unique. Pieces of cloth. Uh -huh. And they were burned on because, of course, that's tradition in America. If the flag is territory, do it. 
But he felt so bad for the prisoners who put this together they, that how much it had meant to them yes. during the war that he couldn't bring himself to doing it. So he folded it up, put it in his pocket, and kept it hidden for years. And he much later donated it here to our museum. And, uh, and if you look at it closely, you can just see it's just all little shreds of clothing, fabric that were put together to make the flag. Hand stitch while they're in a prison. In Germany, I suppose? Uh, uh, actually, in the Pacific. Pacific, yeah. My father was a Marine in Iwo Jima. Ah, okay. And, uh, Now, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the astronauts were Masons, and that includes some today. We've had uh, at least one or two of the shuttle pilots who were as well. But these were all flags that were carried either to the moon or into space. Wow. That's Bob Dole's cap over there from World War II. The chair you see over here, the ejection seat and the pilot's uniform, our current grand executive director uh, uh, is uh, Avril Sizemore. Yes. Uh, Admiral Sizemore is a carrier pilot. Uh, I know he did over a thousand carrier landings, probably many more than that. I don't know the exact number. His son, who also is an Admiral now, when you Sizemore Jr., that's his photo, he is uh, an active duty Navy Admiral. He flew the last F 14 combat over Iraq. And that's a photo of the planes he was in. And this is the uh, seat that actually came out of that plane and the uniform he wore. And that was the last time the plane was used in combat. So you're saying it's not just for has beds? No. Harry Truman's collar when he got his 33rd. Only Murphy's dog tags. In the round room are prominent masons who are either politicians or military officers, leaders in our country. Henry Clay, Thomas Cole, Zebulon Pike, yeah. Got two bikes here, huh? Absolutely. Oliver Ellsworth. Is that Jefferson? That's Jefferson, isn't it? Uh, that's Washington. Looks that like Washington? Jefferson. That was the painting that was done in Washington. A few that was actually done from life. That was done about a couple years before he died. He's had and dental problems. If you look at it, he doesn't look very happy. That's because everybody thinks he had these wooden teeth actually weren't wood. They were made out of uh, a porcelain, but they used all kinds of stuff in a porcelain here and all home together. Yeah. They were very uncomfortable. And that was done right before he died. And they consider that probably the most. Uh, now, was Robert Burns, all these are Burns books. He was, was a Mason. He was a Mason. Yes. And so uh, when I see these guys that uh, they, they put on the kilts and they do yes. presentations, yes. they're probably Masons then, wouldn't you? Often, yes. yes. A lot, there are a lot of lodges around the world that have, uh, were maybe started by uh, Scots or they have a population of Scots within them that will actually hold a Burns night on an annual basis to commemorate him. Yeah. Very, very prominent Mason. Uh, this is so many of the ancient cultures. This uh, symbol is in some places considered a symbol of eternity. You see it in a lot of brickwork, a lot of textiles. Very, very common. Even India. You Even find India. it in ancient India. Yeah. Very, very common. The decorative element around. This is a real masonry building. Yeah, the, the stones and everything do support it, including these huge columns that you see up here. And this is the temple room again, my favorite room to look at. It. Nine pointed star, wonderful. Beautiful room. More of the lamps like you saw from downstairs. Amazing. Look at that skylight. Look at the detail. Remember, I mentioned to you earlier, if you look real quick at the light, and if you look at the detail, you can see like the ringlets of his beard. And you would, I, I just can't imagine nowadays you would see that kind of craftsmanship. And this is Neptune. Yes. Just incredible. And the, the decorative work around the entrance. I mean, just, Sweetie, this, and of course, the, on the uh, top on the ceiling. That's the, this nine-pointed star, again, goes all the way back to ISIS. It, yes. it's, it's, it goes through almost every major religious tradition. Yes. It's one way or the other. An octave. That's the Ahura Master. The angel with two wings. Is that the Ahura Master? Oh, oh, close to that. I mean... It is the Mahura Master with a triangle in the middle, right? You know who the Mahura Master? That's the great symbol of Zoroastrian religion. Yeah. Did Up you know at the that? top, it looks like very similar to that. Yes. No, it's, but uh, it's the primary symbol of Zoroastrianism. And well, what a beautiful demonstration of the light. Yes. 